Welcome to the Informed Pregnancy and Parenting Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Elliot Berlin, and you have tuned into a great episode. I'm going to start by introducing my co-host for tonight. She's a wife, mother, birth worker, and artist. She's a doula, Reiki practitioner, yoga instructor, hypnobirthing, childbirth educator, and studies herbalism. She's the queen of steam, making and selling vaginal steam stools and steaming blends. Nicole Sessions, welcome back. Hey, hey. And our guests tonight are husband and wife and parents-to-be. Each of them is very accomplished in diverse areas, and my research on them for this episode made me both fascinated and curious to learn more. I'm excited to take our listeners along for the ride. Briefly, she is a media personality, tattoo artist, model, entrepreneur, musician, author, art collector, and now a very stylish incubator. Kat Von D, welcome to the podcast. <laughs> I've never been called an incubator before. I, know. <laughs> I like it. You heard it here first. <laughs> Uh, he is a musician, author, painter, sculptor, and seems like he's just warming up. Rafael Reyes, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Dr. Berlin. It's really <laughs> great to have you guys. Oh, it's great to be here. I had the pleasure of meeting you both and starting to get to know you about a month ago. And before that, I didn't really know anything about either of you. But one thing I can say for sure is that when you're both in the room together, including right now, the love and passion is palpable. It's not, <laughs> it fills the whole space. You know what I mean? It's not that PDA over the top, gooey, affectionate, like physical stuff. Um, it feels a lot deeper than that. And it's really beautiful to be oh, around. Thank you. And, uh, yeah. It's made me aim for that yeah. in my oh. own relationship. So, oh, that makes me so happy. So thank you. <laughs> Um, I want to spend the first segment learning more about you guys and your interesting backgrounds and how you got to where you are today. And then the second part, learning more about your pregnancy okay. and your plans for childbirth and parenthood. So, Kat, I'll start with you. Sure. Back at the beginning, you were born in Mexico. Yep. But Von Drachenberg isn't the most Latina sounding name. <laughs> yeah. So my, my mom and dad are, are both from Argentina and my dad was a missionary for the church. And so uh, he traveled to Mexico and was building... Uh, clinics in places where there was absolutely no clinics. And so um, that's how the three of us, my brother, sister, and I, were born in Mexico. Um, so he he comes from a German background, so von Drachenberg, which means dragon of the mountain. Um, there's a castle outside of Cologne still that's a museum now and um, overlooking the river that I still have yet to see. My grandmother, like, has a, uh, I've seen a slide of her standing in front of it. But, um, but yeah, the, I, I just always say I'm a mixed up Latina because that's really what I am. Because <laughs> in Mexico, people are like, oh, you have an accent. In Argentina, people say, oh, you have an accent. <laughs> so, but here you don't really have an accent. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I don't have a Valley Girl accent, right? <laughs> no, not <laughs> no. at all. Is, yeah. Did you grow up in the Valley? No, I, I don't know why. No. I, just, I, I feel like if you're like talking about American accents, it's usually like cowboy or valley girl, right? So It's true. They're very powerful. <laughs> South, the southern. Yeah, yeah. Um, when did you leave Mexico? Um, we moved here to America in 1988, so I was six years old oh, or, really? or f five or so. Do you remember the, the first five years? Or oh, some yeah, of for sure. I mean, Mexico was some of my favorite times of my life. I mean, they were just so simple. You know, we lived like on dirt floors that were like packed with um, water. Like that was, you know, uh, my childhood pictures are me bathing in a bucket. You know, we didn't have <laughs> running water and stuff. And that's what happens when you're going to a third world place where, you know, you're, you're, you know, doing missionary work, you know, as my dad was, it's like, you're not going to places that are posh and nice and, you know, beautiful. But I just remember those were the times where my family was the closest, you know, we were, it was just so, so simple. And, you know, I, I remember being a tomboy and like packing frogs into my pockets and them coming out like in the dinner table and stuff like that. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, they were Seventh-day Adventists. Yeah. So my, my, my family, well, we were all brought up Seventh-day Adventists. I, I, I don't consider myself SDA or anything at all, but... No. No, yeah. So but, SDA, I mean, a lot of people don't really even know what it is. To me, it just seems like almost Jewish with a lot less food. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's like, yeah, it's still like a, Chris, a Christian based religion, but it has like a lot of Jewish traits. So we kept the Sabbath growing up and like none of my friends knew what that was and we were deaf like I never was able to you know go to like slumber parties and stuff like that like, Whoa. but <laughs> well, not that we had that many friends but um but yeah so and we know we didn't eat like any fish without scales like um, oh, like kosher like kosher mm -hmm. rolls yeah yeah so I've never had like shrimp or lobster my whole life like yeah wow. I've never eaten that yeah, yeah. Well, and I'm vegan now, so I'm like, that's cool. It's, it's not going to happen. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I didn't eat, I've never eaten it either. And I remember when I, we were dissecting basically seafood yeah. in uh, high school biology, like the lobster, one of the kids was like, oh, that lobster tail looks delicious. Oh, like, oh that looks terrible. terrible. <laughs> well, I guess if you haven't had it, you yeah. don't know. Um, 
Yeah. So, so you know, we, it was it was quite a strict upbringing. Um, so, needless to say, I probably you know put my parents through the ringer, like, just through all the things I've been into over you know, I was, you know, when they're quite conservative. So, having a mohawk Still? when you're 14, yeah, yeah. I mean, I would say my dad. I mean, my parents are much more open now because they've dealt with me for the last <laughs> uh, 36 years. Yeah, but um, but yeah, I think uh, you know, no, they, I mean. My parents are amazing. They're just, um, you know, they're not Americanized in a lot of ways. And I think that that's one of the things I love about our childhood and, you know, the way we were brought up. You know, the, like, I had no idea who New Kids on the Block were when I first when we first moved to America. That was, like, the band. Yeah. And, uh, I remember, you were the New Kids on the Block. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I remember going to school and, like, seeing kids, like, wearing little buttons with, like, Jordan or whoever, Johnny, or, you know. And my sister and I, we were, like... Learning English, we didn't really care. So n- nothing like what people were wearing, like any material things, we just weren't interested in. You know, I was always drawing, and um, you know, we were always playing with each other, and you know, exercising our imagination versus like te- we ha- we couldn't afford uh, t- television, so you know, like cable or whatever. So I didn't know what MTV was or any of that stuff, and I love that. You know, I think uh, I had like I had like I don't know how, what's the American term for like. I was ahead of other people in that sense, you know, because we weren't bogged down by all the stuff that I think kids are nowadays. Oh, even worse now. Oh, yeah, yeah. Realism and the media. Yeah, yeah. The media is tw- is you. Like, yeah. You can't even separate the kids from the media. Yeah. You, But you're you're very into the arts. Yeah. Right? Music and art collection and, and reading, and you, you became an author and, yeah. and a singer, and you play piano. Just we have a little piano <laughs> in the studio, and you pulled up to it and just hammered out some keys. Thanks. Um, where did you pick that up? Well, um, I was classically trained since I was about five Five years old is when we started. So when you moved here to mm-hmm. California, yeah. So my grandmother, who was a pianist, um, she she was like a real pianist. Um, Your Drachenberg uh-huh. grandmother, yeah, my the, dad's uh, side, family? okay, yeah. And so she was like the cold German woman. So like, <laughs> <laughs> like they weren't cute, like fun, like piano lessons. It was like, you know, I've definitely felt like shamed <laughs> at some <laughs> points if I didn't get it right. But funny enough, my brother and sister never didn't really stick to it. And for me, I just obsessively like just grew deep deeply in love with classical music. It was your grandmother who taught you? Yeah, so we had wow. weekly piano lessons. We had practiced two hours a day. Like wow. when everybody was no. having fun, I was at a timer crying and my mom's like, it's not starting until you start. Like, oh. and I'm like, ah! And now I love them for it, you know? Do you play regularly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, is it therapeutic for you? Yeah, and I think I just, music has always been my number one passion, you know, uh, more so than drawing and stuff, so it's always been my my dear friend, you know, growing up. So, who are yeah. your musical influences? Um, in the classical world, in, in oh. any world. Um, I mean, I love you play classical. I play classical, so I read music, but I, I write music now too. So I can, you know, I've stemmed away from like Chopin and Beethoven, who's my favorite, and Mozart and stuff like that. But um, yeah, I think modern day stuff. It's like all goes all across. You know, I love everything from my husband's music to you know uh thank I love, you <laughs> i love a lot of 80s stuff so the depeche mode and the cure and you know romantic you know, hopeless romantic music i love do you play other instruments besides piano yeah um i play uh string instruments so i can play guitar and things like that i have harpsichords and organs but technically it's piano uh, i collect a lot of obscure instruments so our house has like a funny music room. Whenever you come over, you'll see. Um, Definitely, I can't yeah. wait. Yeah, so I can play by oh, ear. Cool. I'm a little ADD, so lessons were horrible for yeah, me. Yeah, yeah. Because as soon as I knew what something was supposed to sound like, I couldn't look at the notes. They yeah. drove me nuts. Yeah. So I can play by ear, but the downside of playing by ear is if you don't do it all the time, you can only play what you can remember. Yeah, so yeah. So oddly enough, I play Packabell's Canon. Oh, cool. Nice. And usually <laughs> if you play one song, it's like yeah. Chopsticks or Mary Had a Little uh-huh. Lamb. On Packabell's nice. Canon. On piano and on guitar, it's uh, Paradise City. Oh, cool. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Good range. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, Jim. And so I want to see your obscure instruments. I can yeah. probably learn one song on each. Cool. I love that. <laughs> great. And um, also, you have a really beautiful singing voice. Oh, thank you. Did you take lessons for singing, or I, is that just. I did. Um, when I decided to write an album, I just like anything else, I was like, you know, in order to master something, it takes, it's not, I mean, I don't believe in naturals, to be honest. I don't like people are like, oh, wow, you have like a God given gift of drawing. And I don't believe I do at all. I think what I do is not extraordinary in any, any sense. I think anybody can do what, I, what, what we do, 
you just have to put in the effort and the practice, you know? So, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work, yeah. And so so with the singing stuff, I just saw it, again, as like another muscle I needed to train. And, um, you know, I found like a voice coach that I really loved. And um, I was doing vocal lessons with him for six days a week for the first year or two until I started recording. And then um, until I felt like I, I was in control of my voice. And, and But, you know, we're constantly always continuing to learn, you know? I'm yeah. not like yeah. in any way like, I haven't ma- I, I have yet to impress myself, you know, which is a good goal to have. Well, you've already impressed me. But, <laughs> Thanks. And me, baby. Oh, <laughs> so sweet. <laughs> um, all right, tattoos. They're a part of your life. Yeah. Um, when did you get started with tattoos? Um, I started getting and doing tattoos at the age of 14. What was um, your first one that you got? I got an old English J on my ankle for, um, for the, my first love. His name was James. And now I just tell people it stands for... Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> That's what she told me. <laughs> but I still have the tattoo. I love it because it was really such a pivotal time in my life. You know, I just was like, I don't know where I learned this, where I somehow picked up on the idea of freedom and just understanding that, you know, we stand accountable for our actions and like you don't necessarily have to do what people are expecting of you, especially society. And, um, you know, and for me, it was different than a lot of people. I don't condone people dropping out of school or anything like that. But for me, that was something that I quickly understood high school as like um, a social structure. You know, it was like, okay, this is training for what's going to be afterwards as an adult. You know, like the school stuff is easy for me. That's the fun part. I was like, learning is nothing, but it's the dealing with these dynamics, you know, like who's cool based on what. And I just always just saw past that. So when I started tattooing, I was like, I need to focus more of my energy on this. And I I left school and became a full-time tattoo artist. And How old were you? I was, uh, well, I dropped out of school when I was 14. So I went to maybe two weeks of my freshman year. Wow. And then... uh, It's like the first butt of the apple. (laughs) My poor parents, see? (laughs) Um, Did they freak out at 14 when you dropped out of school? Yeah, And, and I think for them, they were really scared mainly by the, how I looked, to be honest. You know, I had um, a shaved head, like I had like a mohawk and colored hair and I was wearing like crazy, just over the top makeup that, you know, I was wearing like eyeliner for lipstick and just dressing. And I don't want to say rebellious because I wasn't rebellious, but I was just, I was expressing something within me that I, I was evoked by music. Um, listening to a lot of punk rock music was like my gateway access into free thinking and, um, you know, it taught me to question authority and like question, like, why do we dress the way we do? Is it because that's what mom dressed me to be or that's what's expected? Or is that what the popular girls are wearing? Like, if I were to ask myself, what do I actually like? It would look a lot different than most people, you know, and I, and I, I don't know where I learned it, but I was OK with that. So from the very beginning, I just I never felt like I belonged, not even within my own family unit. And it was a, a bit of a lonely place, but then you found other like-minded people and it was like kindred spirits. So I quickly like found my tribe, you know, like through music, really. I mean, that's how we met too, yeah. and, um, through that connection and being an outsider. So I think that's something that I've always been pretty vocal about. And uh, I don't want to attribute my success to it, but I attribute like a lot of relatability to well, it's to pretty that. awesome to be able to look inside and say, who am I? What do I want? Yeah. And then just do it even when the outside forces don't want you to. Yeah, of course. 14. Yeah. At 14. Yeah. Like, That's bananas. Like, yeah. 44, yeah. and I'm thinking, I would like trying. to try that sometime. <laughs> I need a J. Well, it's, cr- it's crazy, though, because, you know, I look back and I'm like, you know, I have like a makeup line now and like we have these photo shoots where like they – they're taking pictures of me and I'm like, and I suck at it. I mean, I, I'm better off taking goofy <laughs> photos or like bad posture and stuff, but, uh, but I can do it. I just don't, it's not really my thing, but I trip out because it's like all my life. I've just been accustomed to not being, uh, considered attractive in ways like to, to the like conventional idea of beauty. Like I've always been like obscure and weird or like, I don't know, like, I don't want to say picked on because that sounds dramatic, but like I got made fun of a lot in school, you know, which I was like, yeah, I don't care or whatever. You know, I don't want to be in your fucking cheerleading squad anyway or whatever. (laughs) But um, but yeah, so I'm just so used to it now. It's like it's it's we're in real amazing times because 
you know, having a blue lipstick, that would have not flown at all when I was growing up. You know, I was wearing eyeliner as lipstick. Now you see it on like fashion runways and um, you see like young kids wearing it and people are expressing themselves the same way that I was when I was little, except now they have each other. And, you know, that's that's a beautiful thing. I think it's an exciting and, time. Yeah. And even if they're not geographically close, they can bond together yeah. and form groups. And totally. Have support. Yeah. Um, how did you, like, stand out? I, there's so, so many tattoo artists. How did you rise to the top or stand out from the crowd? Um. Well, let's see. I was tattooing before the TV shows were popular and stuff, so there were not very many female tattooers. I couldn't remember, like, the handful of names of at the time that were good. And other than that, it's very much a male, like, a man, manly man's world, you know? And so, I don't know. I just, I just knew that I had to practice and really be great, like, like my maximum potential. And do you so, practice on people or do you practice well, on Well, I was paper? lucky enough to have a lot of underage friends that were down to get <laughs> tattooed because nice. I couldn't get tattooed at shops. I'm like, yeah. all right, cool, you know. Um, but, yeah, um, you know, I just started off doing simple things and building up, you know. And so I didn't start doing portraits and realism until I was about 18 or 19 years old. And that was my true passion. It's like I love realism. I love tattooing. Um, you know, renditions of whether it's a photograph or, or someone's like pets or whatever. And really, that's when I started connecting with my clients because it was, you know, you're tattooing portraits of people who passed away and um, things like that, like that really connect you with people like it's not it's no longer about the tattoo, you know, and um, and so, yeah, so I think that's kind of how it happened. <laughs> Do you have favorite and least favorite tattoos on you? Oh, on me? Um, I like all my tattoos, even the crappy ones, because <laughs> I, you know, I had like my mom tattoo me, who she doesn't is not a tattooer at all, <laughs> and uh, it looks like a drunk three year old did it, and it, and I love it because it's my mom. A drunk you know? yeah. three year old. Yeah. <laughs> three year old wasn't good <laughs> well, enough. You know. It's a drunk three year old. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, three year olds, sober ones, they they might be pretty good. <laughs> so yeah, um, but I, yeah, I don't. Reg- I think they're landmarks in time, you know, and I think that. You know, I have like exes names and stuff like that that I, I don't necessarily they're not my favorite tattoos, but I don't I don't look at them and go, oh, that guy cheated on me too many times. You know, I just I think about like the time when I got him and it was nice and it was um, there's a lot of learning that happened. And How many times is too many times? Oh, two, no, I said 20 times. Oh, 20. I thought you said that guy cheated on me too many times. Oh, one, like, I one, know one time is too many. That's what I thought. Yeah, I said, standard. I yeah, yeah, yeah. 17. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, television. Is that what kind of boosted you into a household name? Um, I don't know. Um, I, th- I mean, I assume so. Yeah, I, I think um, Did- that, that was kind of like the platform that ended up reaching uh, the masses, you know. And then from there, I built my own little empire, you know. But I don't, I don't really like to give t- television credit because <laughs> I was already super happy and successful prior to that. Mm. Um, but and, in terms of recognizability, right? I mean, you yeah. have a very unique look, but also... Oh, yeah, of course. I mean... Um, I always wonder what it's like to go from sleeping on a floor in a small town in Mexico uh-huh. to becoming oh, yeah. recognized in public. Is that a difficult transition? Um, I, I assume it would be for a lot of people. For me, I just... I don't have that many friends. The friends I do have is a small amount, but they're really close friends and uh, or my family. And, like, I've really been pretty vigilant about like keeping my circle those types of people i think that it can be very easy to surround yourself with yes men or people who are hanging out for the wrong reasons and i think that can be quite toxic you know and 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 it could be a tough transition but i think if you're surrounded by people that genuinely care about you for who you are not for stupid tv shows or money or any of like that stuff then it makes makes it pretty easy, you know. Do you miss being anonymous ever? Is it ever um, like oh, I just want to. I don't know. I've had stars tattooed on my face, so, like since I was like seventeen now. So I feel like, it, you know, I was always getting treated in inter- in interesting ways. Anyway, you're always noticeable. You know, yeah, you know, and not blend on into purpose. The crowd. Yeah, which is weird because I don't like um, somebody on Instagram the other day commented like, "Why are you covering up so much? Is it because you're pregnant?" And I'm like, "No, I just." I, you know, tattoos are an intimate thing for me, which is funny because they're quite external, right? Like people see you and they're like, oh, like it's a good conversation starter. But for me, it's more like, oh, I got this for myself, you know, and and if I want to talk to you about it, that's cool. But I'm not into people grabbing my arms and wanting to like 
you know, have that sense of entitlement, you know. People do that? Just um, they you? used to. I mean, we don't get out of the house much anymore, yeah. but, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but people do. Yeah. People yeah. do. I bet yeah. you do too, because you have tattoos all over people your head. People touch me, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Which is gross. Yeah. <laughs> you can only imagine. Yeah. You need a tattoo right here that says, but don't, don't touch her. me. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Well, <laughs> don't don't hands off. Mandatory. And I, I assume probably too, like when you have a, your baby, like I would get oh, so freaked I out. I like my ninja hands up so quick. <laughs> right? You're always trying to touch your belly. Why do they do that? Entitlement. It's weird, Ignorance. right? It doesn't make know. any sense. It, it should go the other way. If you're pregnant, it should be like that normal four feet. Yeah. should now be six or eight <laughs> feet. But somehow yeah. it's like, let me just touch or, yeah. or like if or I were to comment. touch like uh, like my friend's belly, like just period, like oh, wow. it would be weird. Yeah. Yeah. Like, <laughs> so a total stranger who happens to be pregnant, yeah. you, you would think even weirder. Yeah, no, but, but it's somehow like counterintuitive. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's talk. You mentioned briefly that you have a beauty line with Sephora. Yeah, I was just there. My, yeah. my niece's bought getting some makeup. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. getting some makeup for myself yeah. I like the underage red for me personally <laughs> yeah. uh, it makes me brings me back to my youth um, but it's an insanely popular line what's yeah. different about your beauty line um well I think um the the beauty industry is always changing so you know you I think even as we speak it's changing so it's like uh when I for 10 years ago when I first started the makeup line there wasn't as many as there are now, and now everybody has a makeup line, which is cool. Um, I don't have a makeup line. <laughs> I don't either. Yeah. We need to get on. We I'm just saying to. there's like a yeah, lot of brands. Like I didn't yeah. mean it like that. <laughs> <laughs> there's but, so many. Yeah, and so so I think when I first got into it, it was different because uh, you know, like I said, I came pioneer, from a, baby. You're thank a pioneer. You, thank you. Um, but I think I, ca- I I come at everything I do as like um, from the standpoint of a fan, and I think a lot of companies, especially corporations, don't do that because they don't, they've like blocked out that childhood innocence <laughs> somehow, you know, where they just like, okay, let's look at numbers and what sells and like marketing and blah blah blah, and then they bust out a product based on a formula, you know. Whereas for me, I'm just like, I'm a true fan of makeup. I'm a true fan of music. I'm a fan of tattooing and art. So my approach will always be like from the things that I want to make. So I think that there's a sincerity in that, you know. So I'm not trying to make a product to like sell some, but sell to somebody to like convince them that they need this, like. Nobody needs makeup, you know. But if you want to express yourself in that, and you want some tools, here's a, some really cool, great stuff. So you know? your line is based on the makeup that you would already wear. Kind of. I don't want to say that because I don't want people. It's it's not like the makeup line is about looking like me, you know. Right. I, like my mom wears my makeup, and she does not dress like me at all. <laughs> so so it's you know there's the beautiful duality in that. But yeah, and I think over the years, you know, I, I really started getting more active into my animal rights activism. And so there's just in the beauty world, especially there's so much like terrible cruelty with like animal testing and things like that. So we were kind of one of the pioneers of just being really vocal and beating on like the vegan drum, like loudly as possible and getting people to consume in a more conscious way. So in terms of making your makeup vegan, Mm -hmm. is it? Are there animal products in makeup? or just Oh, my God, the, yeah. I had no really idea. Are? When I first started, I was like, I didn't know what carmine. Carmine is like crushed beetles wings that people put on their lips. So oh, I'm like, wow. yeah. yeah. For dyes. Yeah. yeah. Lanolin is like comes from, uh, there's some that comes from fats from animals and things like that. Um, Collagen. Yeah, fish scales, stuff like that. that. But um, wow, but, I have but no idea. Even more so than that, it's the, it's the it's the animal cruelty aspect of it. So when you say like cruelty-free, it means you don't test on animals. And the testing is just horrific what they do and then i just think in the name of vanity that's just so ridiculous right, the first time i read that i'm like why would they put like lipstick on a pig and things like that but it's you're saying the ingredients that you test how they react to oh no 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 no! they like will make rabbits eat lipstick until they die like th- those that's one of the tests for example another wow. one is like they'll inject certain chemicals into the, the eyeballs or cut open bunnies and like in, insert ingredients so it's like awful things like that they yeah. never see so like you just test out a lipstick and yeah it's like, oh this is a nice color yeah i mean how, how many more things to every time something new comes out they have to test it again so but how do you test for safety i mean i assume they're doing safety tests for humans. well there's things that have already been approved so it's like so you just use that yeah and also too i think it's like uh you know um a, the main the, the main thing about it is that it's a really huge industry in china and so in order to sell in china which is really big numbers companies will say okay well we'll test in order to sell in china so it's they're choosing money over you know being able to say hey let's not sell in china and we'll just continue to be cruelty free mm. so but at the, on the other hand there's so many great brands that are 
totally coming on board with that too. So we're not alone on that. So it's nice. I have a million more questions for yeah. you, but I want to get to Papa <laughs> yeah. Bear. Um, you've been sober for many years. What are you sober from? Um, let's see. I just celebrated 11 years in July. July 7th is oh, my wow. sober anniversary. Congratulations. Congratulations. Yeah, Thank yeah, you. Baby. Yay. Happy uh, anniversary is, is what do people say? Um, well, I, yeah, I think sometimes like in America they say birthday, but I think that sounds ch- weirdly like juvenile <laughs> like yeah. happy birthday like but um, <laughs> let's have a cake but to be honest i i celebrate my sober anniversary m- much more than i do my birthday like it means a lot more to me because without my sobriety i wouldn't be sitting here with you today or you know have an amazing relationship or a baby on the way so but yeah i was uh mainly drinking i did i had had like a three-month stint of drugs thank you um but then, um, but yeah, then I just decided to, to quit one day, and I haven't looked back. So, yeah. Oh, there was no method or process? Well, I mean, you know, a lot of people will take, like, the AA route. I read the book, like, the big book, which I loved. But I think for me, I'm I'm a, a lone wolf in ways, of, especially therapy-wise. I love one-on-one stuff versus, like, group therapy. And um, to me, it, it works a lot better. And unfortunately, like, my experience with some of the AA and I don't want to bash it in any way, but, you know, Al- Alcoholics Anonymous is supposed to be emphasis on the anonymous part, you know, but now with social media, it's just, uh, nothing's it's just anonymous. nothing's anonymous. And, you know, I really struggled with that because I think becoming sober is like tough enough, let alone to have to have like people weigh in on that is, it's a hard journey. So for me, it was a lot easier to just to do it on my own. And I, I went through therapy and like um, read a lot of wisdom books and things, but the main thing was just filtering out like the friends that didn't really serve me in a positive way, so which can be hard sometimes. Seems hard but healthy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Do you, do you? I mean, eleven years later, mm-hmm. is it still challenging? Or oh no, <laughs> I, I like I couldn't totally in the past. Yeah, I mean, you could do drugs and drink in front of me, and it, I wouldn't be tempted at all. I just t- I just choose not to hang out with people that do drugs. You know, um, drinking doesn't bother drinking me as much. Drinking happens all over, so it's hard to get away from it kind of i don't know i have my i have a lot of sober friends i mean my husband also sober and And there's all those three-year-old drunkards doing tattoos (laughs) (laughs) gotta stay away from that (laughs) there's such bad influences too (laughs) uh all right rafael you were born in mexico yes dr berlin i was (laughs) (laughs) tell me about your early beginning oh early beginning let's see um i didn't I was born in Mexico, Cotija, Michoacán, and my father left my mother and myself in Mexico behind so that he can come to the United States um, to pursue a better life for us. So he came. Um, well, how old were you when that happened? Um, I, very young. I was probably like one. Oh, wow. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I didn't see my father until I was four years old when he sent for us. So he got himself established. Once he got established and we came over, my mother and I, um, and the you know, I was in the trunk of a car, you know, so I was smuggled sneak, in. Sneak over. Yeah, yeah. I was smuggled in. And um, I was raised in San Diego, California. I went to school there. I went to Pacific Beach Elementary and dropped out of high school. I opened up a... Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Wait, we're living parallel like lives here. Right? Yeah. Parallel, yeah, I dropped out of high school really, really young. And I opened up a restaurant when I was 18 years old, uh, uh, the first vegetarian restaurant in San Diego. This was back in 91, 92, very... Um, well, it's not only young to drop out of high school, but but to start a business and a food business, a restaurant business, which is, can be pretty challenging. And support his whole family, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I... Uh, um, where, where do you even get the know-how to do that? I started working really young. My father used to take me with him to... Um, wh- what, wherever he worked, whatever restaurant he worked out, he would find a way to get me in there. And after school, I would go and work. So and I started washing dishes and I started prepping. And then by the time I was 17, because I opened up the restaurant at 18, by the time I was 16, I did a mentorship uh, at the place that I was working at, um, Ole Madrid, with this um, chef that had uh, all these awards. He was like a, a big name in that world of, of culinary arts. And he taught me everything I knew um, at a really young age. And I actually ran a like a five-star restaurant at a really young age. So then um, I wanted to do it for myself. I mean, the story is a little darker than that, what led me to um, running a restaurant by myself. Um, but, you know, not to dive in deep. I, I basically said, hey, you know what? I'm going to do this on my own. Um, 
and and I did, you know, for um the re- restaurant's still yeah. there. It's for it's been running for like twenty two or twenty three years. Yeah, I um gave it to my brother. Um, I want to say yeah, all, all three of your brothers that work there. Right? Yeah, I gave it to my brother like six years ago. I got myself in some trouble. Uh, my father and I were really close, but uh, we used to bump heads a lot. Um, so for the the, the are, you, re- are you similar to each other? Um, no. no, no, not not at all, <laughs> okay. not at all. So um, it wasn't that bumping but heads. My uh, my father. Um, well, you know what? You have to understand. It's too. a soft spot for me. Yeah, to but, talk about my father, I will but, start. Crying. It's okay, but I I, I think yeah. what, what what should be noted is that you know, and especially in Mexican culture, and this doesn't this is obviously very generalizing. It's not in every family dynamic, but um, in in Latin culture too, it's always like the eldest is kind of bestowed this responsibility of overlooking for the family. You yeah. know, so like if the father passes away, it kind of you know goes down to whoever the next kid is and you know you were the the yeah i was i am the oldest you're the oldest yeah i am and so when his father passed away you know it was like um yeah i stepped up yeah um, which is a lot you know to take on when you're that young and interestingly enough i know we're not talking about the pregnancy yet but like but <gasps> for us to, to <laughs> for, for us to be going through this journey together now has been really amazing because it's helped us like reflect a lot on our own childhood yeah. and our own like parents and how they raised us and I mean, I'm sure that that just happens naturally, right? Yeah. Yeah, and I think um, that's a, that's a really good thing. To yeah, reflect. it's beautiful, yeah. right? Yeah, some to healing. Process. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, like healing. Exactly. Sets you yeah. up. Mm-hmm. Something I'm looking forward to. You know, I had my I have I have a daughter. I have a uh, my daughter's 24 years old now. Oh wow! And I had her when same when I was uh, really young. I was 17, 17. years old. 17. Um, but this is such a different yeah. experience now. Yeah, and and I didn't get to. Um, be like a parent you know not only was i really young but i was running this restaurant that i was uh uh working at you know seven days a week yeah. uh, 12 hours a day um so i mean i was a provider but i wasn't but able you're to, also 17 you know yeah. so for, it's really mind-blowing like so <laughs> to have, i look at teenagers today i know like, i can't even get them to like put their laundry in the hamper <laughs> like, yeah so yeah. i'm excited I'm i'm excited for the for our pregnancy yeah and to be able it's, to do it differently you know to be there and not have to worry about oh man i have to be at work you know because yeah. yeah. we're now you know financially and stable and also and mentally we're older. too it's mentally, different yeah. yeah it's a whole different world yeah. yeah are you still connected to your daughter yeah we are um i mean we've had a, a small falling out you know and we're trying to uh, mend those wounds um, but yeah, you know, I love my daughter and we were extremely close for a long time. And then we had a, a falling out and it's been, it's been rough, you know, it's been rough, but we're, we're trying to work things out, you know? Um, you wrote a book. So, yes. and, and tell me what the book is about. Uh, you know, the, the book is, um, how old were you of- when they wrote the book? Wasn't, I it was not that long ago? Not, no, it was Yeah, it was like two weeks ago. No, <laughs> no, no. no. The, the really book, I want to say same, maybe like five or six years ago. Okay. Uh, Living dangerously. Oh, actually, no, I think maybe eight. I think I wrote it in like uh, 2010. I had just gotten out of jail, and I wrote that book in jail. It was more of a of a practice. You see, I, I as when I was young, um, I saw a lot of therapists and um there was a lot of exercises that that they taught me because i was really angry when i was young i was kind of uh for lots of different reasons i mean not to get too in depth but um i had some issues um a lot of it uh, a lot of you know i kind of i kind of come from uh, a dysfunctional family and whatnot but a lot of it um had to do with um the environment and me also being from somewhere else and trying to uh, adapt, you know, to to this n- whole new world. And I think being I was just, from Mexico, being from Mexico, and trying to adapt to San yeah, Diego. Exactly. And I think a lot of it w- it was rough. And then uh, until acclimated, still the, once I acclimated, then I, w- I certain things were already set in me. You know, already already had my personality set in stone. And and I uh, because of it, you know, I got in a lot of trouble when I was young and even. You know, I balanced it out. I did a lot of good things, but I also got in a lot of trouble, you mm-hmm. know. So I did things for my family to make them proud, but also did a lot of things that were the opposite. So um, 
Living Dangerously. The book. Is the book. Yeah, so I ended up in jail. Um, and again, these practice. this book was just a practice uh, from things that I learned in therapy, which was just kind of writing. Um, it was like self self-exploration, you know, and just trying to go back inside yourself. And I was trying to figure out what had led me into jail. I was like, because... I really didn't even know how I ended up in jail because during that time I was drinking and I was very upset at myself and I was trying to punish myself because my father passed away and I blamed myself for his death because we have a, we got in a really, really ugly fight the day that he passed away. Wow. So I unraveled. You see, I before that, I was my father's nurse. I took care of my father for four years wow. and the restaurant was established. So I was making uh, great money. So I didn't really have to work. The restaurant was running itself. My father was in a nursing home and he didn't want to be there. He wanted to be home. He was like, hey, I, if I'm going to die, I want to die in my house. Um, but he was kind of blacklisted from the nursing communities because from the nursing community because he he had a bad attitude, you know, and he would do things that people would quit all the time. So we put him in a nursing home. Same things were happening there. And um, he, he just wanted to come home. So I said, hey, you know what? I took it upon myself because um, we had this relationship where I was always chasing him for um, always wanted him to um, – acknowledge me in a certain way so i think maybe that's why one of the reasons i like opened up the restaurant really early and did all these kind of things you know but i think in a certain way they were doing the opposite you know um so but the book was a really good way for you to be able to like yeah long story short the book was me just trying to make sense of why i ended up in jail so it was it, more for yourself yeah oh, everything i've done the music you. everything that i do has always been about just self exploration yeah. and self-awareness it's it's always been a, about me trying to have this relationship with myself and, that, and but growing up you you also were in part of a gang yes yes I, I got jumped into a gang okay so this all go again it all ties into my father the book the jail um i got jumped into a gang when i was 13 years old oh wow my father my how does that happen just well i didn't want to be in a gang it wasn't something that i, I was like uh aiming at or i was actually I was really good at school and whatnot, and um, I was an artist. Kind of, I wanted but, to be but an it, artist. But a lot of that is just your surroundings. You it know? was it's my environment. Yeah, it's so, we can't really blame it on. I'm not blaming yeah, it on yeah. on anyone. I'm just uh, so uh, sorry if if that's uh, how yeah. I portrayed it. But um, no, um, it has nothing to do with my. Okay, so I have to tell <laughs> the story. My father got in a fight with some defending my sister, my youngest sister. Um from some guys that were, that are in the gang that I got jumped into, that I'm from, the gang that I'm from. So this was before I got into the gang. So my my father defended my little sister and he beat these two guys up. And I and I saw it, I witnessed this. It was my first time ever seeing my father fight. Um, so now I'm going to school and in school I'm hearing rumors and, 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 and talk. People are talking about the incident that my dad was in, you know, my father defended my my sister and whatnot, and he beat these two guys up. And some of the guys that I'm in school with, um, their older brothers are in this gang that I'm now in, um, or that I've been in since I was 13. But, you know, just I'm no longer like an active gang member, so I'm not like a gang member. I'm like 43 years old. I don't, you know, I've that was a long time ago but i didn't necessarily like, get jumped out or anything like that i just moved on you know i'm just living my life i'm married and but um so the word on the streets is that they're going to hurt my father so so it was a rival gang or or no or, the gang that oh, i'm okay, from oh. are, are saying that they're excuse me um cuz it's a sensitive subject for me so yeah, it, it, sometimes course. it's hard for me to form sentences when i become emotional but um so a friend of mine he's from the gang uh his brother's from the gang and i, I he's the one that told me hey you know my brother and the friends are saying they're gonna harm your dad and i said please talk to your brother for me and ask him if there's anything i can do for them to leave my father alone he does the next day in school um, he approaches me and he says, hey, I spoke to my brother and they said that the only way that they'll leave your father alone is if you join the gang. So that very day when I got off school, 
I went to where, you know, I went to where they all hang out and I got jumped in mm. and I got, I joined a gang because I thought it would keep Just people from safe. hurting my father. Holy cow. And then after that, I just learned the ins and outs and I did what, what you know, I part, you know, I, I, I became a gang member and then, you know, and then I was always in, you know, I like to say in certain interviews when people ask me because, you know, the music that I make, because I, I, my life has really been like a kaleidoscope, you know, so many different shapes and colors. of, So I've, I've, I'm grateful for it, you know. But I really feel that I, I live, uh, that I've lived and I am living multiple realities simultaneously, you know. So, I hear that. That yeah. makes sense. So I know that it, sometimes it's people are like, man, that's an, you're almost like, I've been described as an enigma because it's like, wait, you're, you make this type of music that's electronic and it's gothy, but then you were in a gang and then you opened up a restaurant, a, a vegetarian restaurant at that at, at the age of 17. Yeah, I've really have, I've, I'm, I have, I've experienced a, a, a cornucopia or a, a plethora of just different types of experiences, you know, I'm grateful for all of them because they've really made me who I am, you know. When did you start getting tattoos? Man, well, when I got jumped into a gang, oh, you know, right I got my I got my first gang tattoo on on my back, so which also is Sherman. Like around fourteen. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, another yeah. parallel here. Yeah, living uh, parallel lives. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, parallel lives with my wife. And you have a bunch of them. Do you also? I asked Cap, but do you have a favorite or a least favorite? Yeah, my wife's name. You know, I have her name on my on my cheek here. Oh, your oh yeah, face. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> my face. That was a birthday Catherine. present. Yeah. For you? Did you do it? No, no. I, I would not be so vain. <laughs> <laughs> no. I'm no. like, I know where I want to put my name uh, on your face right here. I know. <laughs> I was actually in, in Europe on tour with IMAX, and then I was coming back like the day before my birthday, and you were going to pick me up from yeah. the airport, and then he showed up, and he had, I had it. Yeah, it was the sweetest yeah, thing. Yeah, and I didn't want to tattoo my face, because, you know, that's how I pay my bills. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but I went Fair. for it. <laughs> um, is there, uh, just out of curiosity, is there any part of the body you can't tattoo? Um. Well, I mean, there's parts that are um, less, they're more resilient to the pigment. So, you know, like the bottoms of your feet or your your palms of your hand. I mean, I have the, my hands tattooed, but it's you, it's quite crude. You can't get very detailed oh. just because it's just more callousy. So, um, yeah, so there's parts like that. But, um, yeah, but for, for the most part. You um, tattoo on because I've seen the inside. Of yeah. yeah. What about mucous yeah. membranes? Like I have the, I have mouth, the inside of my, vulva, my like, well, I have, your eyelid. <laughs> I've like done any... my eyelid uh, on, on my eyelid, not inside the eyelid. But I don't know. I think, um, I mean, I, as a tattooer for me, I'd personally just like whenever I'm doing a tattoo, it's like asking yourself like if to make sure the person's not going to regret it, you know. So I think there's some some ideas oftentimes like sound like a good idea and can easily backfire too. So I'd rather go to sleep at night feeling good, 100% that everybody I tattoo is going to be happy <laughs> versus yeah. like taking a chance on Do stuff people like put them on like private spots? Um, yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> I don't have it. I, I know, I, I don't either. Oh, look, I don't have it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't either. She's like, I do. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I forget when I put on deodorant. Um, it's, um, <clears throat> but have you done them to people? I have. I mean, I've tattooed um, people in their private areas. Yeah, men and but, women both. Yeah, but you know, it's not like I think it's like it, before it'd be like so, a very macho thing. Like, yeah, I want to get a tattoo on my dick, you know. And it's like, sure, man. Like everybody w- says that, but then when it's time to do it, it's like you know, that's just. Can you imagine the sensitivity and just how? Yeah, I yeah. can't even yeah. imagine it on my arm. Yeah, so. yeah. Is exactly. there a most a more most sensitive place where you've gotten um, tattoos? I think it's. I mean, you know what? This would actually be. Because you have them on you, your head, which also looks pretty. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you 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 actually would be a a master at knowing this stuff because it's really about nerve endings more than actual like fatty tissue. So a lot of people think, oh, I'll get my butt tattooed because there's a lot of fat and cushion there, but a lot of your nerves are are, are close together totally. Close so to. it's actually one of the more sensitive yeah. places. Mm, interesting. So um so it's more based upon your nerves versus like your you know, muscle or fatty tissues. So. How much is in the way? Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. Just a, that was a little diversion. But, Sorry. <laughs> um, I want to get back to your music. Mm. Right. Um, how did your, you, right now you're, you have a band Prayers. Yes. And um, it's been described as cholo goth. Yes. Which cholo goth. <laughs> like genre. very separate worlds <laughs> coming together. Yeah. Tell me about that. 
Yeah, you're same. a pioneer, baby. I'm a pioneer. <laughs> Look at that. Another <laughs> parallel. <Both> pioneers. <laughs> yeah. Um, same thing, you know. I just, uh, how can I say? I, I, I went to a white school. <laughs> and then I grew up in a Mexican neighborhood. I combined Smush the two. Yeah. 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 So that's what happened. Yeah. But same thing, you know, I really wasn't even, I've always wanted to do music, but I never had, um, I never had the opportunity. I was always working. And um, um, even when, I'm, again, you know, same thing, same thing. It came from my dad. My, I, I was in jail. I wrote this book. And, and uh, in jail, my dad came to me in a dream. It was as real as this conversation that we're having here. And um, he shook me up, you know. He he came to he came to me. He said he loved me, that he forgave me, and that he wanted me to start living for myself and not for our family or for anyone else. And he really wanted me to start, uh, you know, to do what's in inside my heart, whatever my heart desires to to go for it. So when I got out of jail, I literally, I you know, I started, I taught myself. I got out of jail, locked. I I I own a home. I own. You know, I have I have a home. And instead of moving into my home, I rented it out, and I moved into my garage, locked myself away for a whole. Year. Right when I got out of jail, I was kind. Of, I didn't want to be around people. Um, kind of same thing. I just um, just needed to adjust. I, I needed to adjust. Thank you. That's what I do. And, mm-hmm. and so I locked myself. Away. I rented the house to my brother, and I stayed in a garage. Oh, wow. For a year. And I watched a bunch of YouTube channels on how to produce and play instruments, and I taught myself. And then I, and that's it. Now that's we're impressive. Here. That's how badass. long were you in jail for? Not that long, six months. That's a long oh, time. It seems like <laughs> yeah, no. I mean, that's like where we're like like at six months long. pregnant right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but, no, but I needed it. You know, it was a good thing. I, I'm, I'm not a, I'm, you know, I'm not going to say anything bad about it. It, it really helped help me. In so many ways, it's, been, was, it's been a big part of like your rehabilitation. Yeah, like, I was very self-destructive. Yeah. I was punishing myself. You know, was like the, the system putting you in there. Just no, 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 no. no <laughs> okay, no, not but at it all. turned out to be a good thing. Yeah, for I you. just make the best of any yeah. situations. And when I was in there, I'm a, I'm a creative. I've always been, and I, I'll take any any opportunity to create. And I was like, okay, I'm in here six months. I'm gonna write a book, mm-hmm. and and then I was like, okay. Uh, I was like I said, the restaurant was doing well. So when I got out, I was like, "Hey, I'm just gonna stay in this garage. I don't, I don't need anything. I don't need to go to work." I'm and, just you know, that's one here. of the things that honestly we connected through is just, um, you know, we both have like exteriors that I think uh, can be very intimidating or they give off an impression of, you know, har- hardness. I think I don't know how else to describe that. But one of the things I love about Raphael which a lot of people don't know is like, you know, they hear his music and they hear the lyrics and it's aggressive. And I love it. I, it's amazing. It, it evokes a lot of feelings for me, too. But one of one of the things that, you know, we really connected over um, was just his, his gentle heart. You know, he has a very gentle demeanor. Um, there's so much love in there. And I think for somebody who's gone through so much exposure to violence and just a un, pretty unforgiving volatile upbringing like it's just so amazing and inspiring to um you know see you on the other side of that and that's 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 the Raphael that mm-hmm. that I fell in love with and and you can't have one without the other you it's, know it's so hard to picture because you're such a gentle soul right i am i i thank you i mean you're a warm <laughs> gentle soul you're passionate you're loving and you're calm and so this mm-hmm. whole history it's almost like it's like, shocking you, right yeah it's shocking it's like you must be talking about somebody else yeah, yeah. well it feels like you've um, lived a few lives yeah yeah, yeah. 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 no no wonder why you married a cat yeah, yeah. 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 it makes sense so you got a whole bunch of lives here how did you do me how did um, you find well, each other? what's funny and funny enough is we met 14 years ago. Yes, he. Um, I don't remember because this is back in my drinking days. So you know, as embarrassed as I wish I could be, I, I don't remember um, how I behaved. And I, you know, I asked him, "Hey, was I nice? At least was I a nice person?" <laughs> He's like, "You were amazing, whatever." Yeah. And, um, but I, I, those are, those are. Yeah, I guess it's another reminder of like how grateful I am for my sobriety because. I really wish I could remember every single moment that I've ever shared with Raphael, you know, and especially back then, how interesting would it have been to like, oh my God. But instead we reconnected about four years ago yeah. um, and he came over to the house because he had wanted me to, to, to collaborate on a music video for one of his songs. And, um, and I'm, I was, I'm usually like not into doing music videos. So I'm like, okay, they're either going to cast me as a vampire or a, <laughs> a biker chick or Your a drug cast. dealer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I'm like, uh, no thanks. Um, but then, you know, he shows up with this really refreshing, beautifully artful minded treatment for a video. And, um, 
I'm like, who is this guy? He's like everything that I love, you know, like I'm kind of the same come from the same world where it's like I look white, but, you know, I'm Latina and I've never been accepted in, in both worlds, you right. know, so I've always felt like a lack of belonging. And then this guy's like a mirror in like in the most beautiful way ever, you know. And so we re we reconnected at the time I was celibate. So it was like, you know, instantly friend zoned. And I assumed he had like this beautiful like Aztec warrior goddess girlfriend or something. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, but come to find he had a crush on me the whole time. Oh, that's really <laughs> And you sweet. can finish the, the story <laughs> from that point on. Yeah. <laughs> that was pretty much it. The story's still, yeah. um, the story's still yeah. unfolding. Yeah, the story's exactly. I, um, I just want to ask you a couple more questions and we'll take a, a little break. Uh, your, is there a, a message, overall message behind prayers and, yeah. and your music? Yeah, I mean, it's 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 about uh, definitely about empowerment, I think, you know. like it, And this might sound ridiculous, but it's like, it, it's like empowerment through vulnerability, Mm -hmm. You know, if that makes any sense. And uh, I've, I've, people have questioned that. They're like, empowerment through vulnerabil vulnerability makes no sense. But yeah, I mean, that's because that makes sense to me. That's where it all comes from. A lot of a lot of the music and the art, it, again, it's just about self-exploration and self-awareness. But it's it's dialogue that I'm having with those that have hurt me. And I know that I can't be in the same room with them. So if I can just express it through my music, then it works for me because that's even easier, you know, and better because then I can really say what I need to say. But it, it's if you if you really listen to uh, the music like my like the Young Gods album that the majority of that album is about my daughter, you know, and how she hurt me. And it was just me trying to communicate to her, you know. So um, a lot, a lot, a lot of those are like, it's like therapy, me just trying to make sense. I have so many albums that I need to make that, you know, are <laughs> popping into my head that. right now. <laughs> um, we should all make albums I like love that. that. Uh, and then also, in addition to your music, you are a painter and a sculptor. Yeah, it just, uh, it just, uh, I, I, a lot of it comes from uh, like the DIY culture, you know. I, I kind of grew up around that where you just do it yourself. So a lot of times I needed stuff for the restaurant and so i would draw the you know the menu or and and i you know during the time that i was um i've always liked i wanted to be an artist you know but uh my father wanted me to uh kind of and i don't even have the 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 body for it, but he wanted me to be an athlete and i, I so i tried it and it didn't work but <laughs> <laughs> but i always want i always wanted to be, i've been drawing since i was a kid you know that was my escape and writing that was my another escape of mine um but yeah a lot of it came a lot of a lot of it came just from necessity from things that i needed and i was like well i'll just draw it i mean i even i got a scholarship in fashion design you know, so I come. Wow. I did competitions. I went to school for hip hypnosis when I got a jail right after jail. Also, so my first album is the Kill Wave. It, it's uh, it's on the concept of of NLP of neuro linguistic programming. So nice. a lot of it, I was like really just experimenting mm -hmm. with 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 language when when I was. Um, and a lot of it came because the one thing that helped me when I was young was hypnosis. You know, and I don't tell people this. Like I know we're going through the hip. hip, hip I'm sorry, the hypno babies and yeah. hypno birthing and whatnot but um you know I, I went to school for hypnosis and i and i graduated as a hypnotherapist but i never i didn't want to practice because uh, it was more it was for, for self for yeah. self-help because i wanted to control i wanted to be able to control my own emotions and i recalled when i first uh was introduced to it as a kid it was the only thing that helped me with my temper i had gone i had mastered already already all, all everything that i needed to get out of situations with, with therapists i had already mastered the language and i knew okay you know my probation officer needs this so i'll go to the course and i'll learn the la and and i was just kind of like maneuvering just maneuvering my way i was just in order so i wasn't really getting help i was just like yeah, working, working the system. The emotions yeah you know, i was just working the system and and then i got it myself in a, in, a, in a really bad situation where i hurt someone and, and in front of my mother at that and it scared her and she was like very resourceful lady and she found help for me um and that's when i first um got hypnotized and we really got down to a, a lot of like the self-hate and the self you know uh, the pain that i was carrying with me and it helped me it really did like it, it gave me a long fuse the longest fuse ever mm -hmm. and it wasn't until my father died that i unraveled so all the work that i had done 
when my father died, it was it was done. My father just made it all, you know, made me uh, unravel. So then I went back into just being angry and and self punishment and self hurting and 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 when I got out of jail, when I was writing that book. The book is cute. Only that book that I wrote is just a little small part of it that I wanted to share just for a whole different reason. I wanted to do something in my own way that was kind of like introducing certain people in my community into like reading and, and whatnot. So I did it in a certain way. It's, uh, it's fiction, right? But it, it it's is, like loosely based on exactly. real life experiences. Yes. And um, yeah, so um, that... When I got out, I did the music and I went to school for for hypnosis. Again, it was just so that I can control my own emotions, so that like I would be able to go back into the world and not let it, you know, um, destroy me in a sense where I can have the tools that I need in order to just maneuver and get the things that I need in life. I was sort of having like an OMG, like I want to be hypnotized by you. <laughs> so cool. I, I feel love like it. you can draw the real crap that I've been trying to bury in there. Uh, out. I then, love you guys. Yeah, oh, I know. Aren't they so, so lovable? Yeah. It's amazing. All right. I also want to know about your sobriety because you're also yeah. sober. Was that after prison as well? Yeah, uh, that was actually before I knew I was getting ready to go. So as I was, uh, um, you know, they were like, you're going to have to turn yourself in in a certain amount of time. Um, I fought my case for like a year because they were trying to give me seven years. Oh, wow. But, but wow. luckily, you know, uh, which is ridiculous for what I had done. You know what I mean? I, I threw a glass. Uh, at a in a bar, I was in a bar, and I threw a glass. And it just landed on and, a and person, a, a, a hit yeah. the wrong person in the arm, and, and then they wanted to give me seven years for for that. Whoa. It was it That's was insane, insane. Yeah. insane. Uh, and but luckily, I had money. You know, oh, so you can to get a good yourself. lawyer. Yeah. And, if I didn't yeah. have the money, I I wouldn't. I would not know my wife. I'd just be getting out. I, I would have but even out still, then, like, I mean, I honestly, I feel like I wish I would have been around there because we would have got a different lawyer. I'm like, yeah, they, you ended up getting two me. two felonies for that. Yeah, for, so for throwing a glass. Yeah, and <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm it's like, not an excuse. I, it's not an excuse. Is that two strikes? Is that two strikes? Yeah. So in California, we said we have a three strike mm -hmm. rule. So if you have another One strike, more, and that's, and that's life what in life in prison. Yep, that's right. Holy crap! So that's the other reason why actually dove deep into the hypnosis because I yeah. really wanted to be able to like control myself to where I, the only thing that I did not dismantle inside of me because I have a whole bunch of things that, like you know uh, that I embedded in myself but the only thing that I left was life or death you know what I mean so if someone's trying to kill me then I would defend myself but other than that words or even uh, none of that you know and I, I've done a lot of work more? on myself like meaning you got rid of those triggers like those yeah, potential I've got, I've, things I've, I've that might set so you off many triggers. Okay. Yeah. yeah yeah and um, he still road rages though I remember you. <laughs> but, Luckily, Road like, He gets mad sometimes. I'm like, yeah. babe, who cares? Like, the guy was just going yeah. on like, the way over here. I, gotta, but I, I, work I, on I actually, I mean, you're very calm <laughs> considering because what you did was throw a glass. Mm -hmm. It's not like. Yeah. No, yeah. It's... And, and I would think if, if you have, if there was a three strikes rule, like if I got caught speeding three times, then they'd take my car away and I can never drive again. And I had already gotten caught speeding twice. I, I can't imagine how I would drive, like, so yeah. nervous and delicate and tender. But this is, like, your life. One more oh, just yeah. random thing. And yeah, scary, that could be eh? life in prison. Yeah. It is very do, scary. Do, do you feel that pressure on a regular basis? Or? Um, no, no, because you, you're, you're such a, I mean, we're, we're so square. <laughs> we're so mellow. Yeah. We were yeah. Little, vegan. Yeah, we're, we're sober. We, like, volunteer at Farm Sanctuary. <laughs> we hang out indoors it's most a, of the it's time. It's a whole new world. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. All right. Tune in for part two of our conversation with Kat Von D and Rafael Reyes as we talk about their pregnancy, plans for labor and delivery, parenthood, and beyond on the Informed Pregnancy Podcast. Doctor, doctor, give me the news. I got a whole lot of questions for you. This podcast is a proud member of Parents on Demand, a network of high-quality shows for families just like yours. 
Download our free network app on Apple and Android and listen to your favorite episodes on the go.